gospel. And as we think about imparting a blessing, we took to Jesus and Zacchaeus in Luke 19, 1 through 7. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see Jesus, who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. You may be seated. Some of you know that we've been following, again, the book Life of the Beloved by Henry Nouwen to be a guide for the summer series. As we come to the name of blessedness, uh, Nouwen says that claiming your own blessedness always leads to a deep desire to bless others, that the blessed the blessed one always blesses, and people like you and me want to be blessed. This morning I want to talk about how we convey a blessing. There's uh, such a thing as a cup of blessing, a blessing cup that I've done in small groups where you uh, have this cup of blessing and you pass it from one person to another, and you give that person a blessing, and then you drink from the cup. The, uh, a blessing is really, can be a form of a prayer. It can be very simple. It's saying something complimentary about the other person, acknowledging the goodness of that person, their self-worth, their God-given gifts. It reaches beyond what many cannot see and looks deep into the soul of the other person where God sees. You know, a modern-day proverb that a lot of you know is that if you can't say anything nice, don't, don't say anything at all or keep your mouth shut. <laughs> when you convey a message, you are showing what a person, a blessing, you're showing what a person means to you, how that person makes you feel, how that person has touched your life. The blessing conveys that the other person is loved, that God is at work in their lives. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. From Philippians 1, 6, it was on my ordination banner at annual conference many years ago. Let's pray. Lord, we are so glad that you're not finished with us. That we're all unfinished, still being fashioned, products of yours, reflections of who you are. Keep us at the foot of the cross. Keep us close to you so that we can understand who we are and whose we are. And as we do that, let us remember our blessings and convey those to others. Amen. So what happens when you give a blessing? What's the re response? Blessing strangers... And that can happen. I'm going to tell you about that in a few moments. Um, makes you one of them. You, maybe you're not a stranger any longer to that person. Or at least it closes the gap. It makes them feel affirmed as a beloved child of God. 
and, but it allows you, the conveyor, to walk away with a smile that lightens your step. It makes you want to repeat it, to bless others and to continue to bless, to keep passing it on. And it makes you want to live up to a God standard. That's what happened every time Jesus blessed someone. And he would bless those who no one else would necessarily bless. As he was walking through Jericho that day, and you know the story from childhood, looking up into a sycamore tree and looking at the despised tax collector, a little man, Zacchaeus. And as he looks up into that tree, and there was Zacchaeus wanting to get a good look because he knew who the Lord was. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. I want to bless you. Look what it did to Zacchaeus. It changed who he was. He wanted to make things right. He wanted to adhere to a godly standard after that blessing. So last Sunday, when Herb was with you, in seizing the day, he wanted us to count our blessings. So I was impressed how 65 people wrote their blessings and you put them on a board. That's what it looks like after uh, both of the services. I looked at each one of those and it was a beautiful prayer time for me. I wanted to see what, um, what were the categories of your blessings? What was most important on your heart? So let me share what you conveyed in terms of blessings in your life. The number one category was family. And that shouldn't surprise you. There were 46 people that mentioned family. The second category was God and all the things related uh, to God and to Jesus Christ as Savior and to the Holy Spirit. One person said, I am blessed to be adopted and chosen by God, God's beloved for all eternity. Somebody else said, I'm blessed to worship an awesome God. People talked about God's creation and the beauty of God's creation, that Jesus Christ can always be counted on, leaned upon, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Some of you talked about God's faithfulness, how you can be bold because of the Lord, that you're blessed because you have an opportunity to serve God and be an example of His love. Some of you said that God's importance in your life allows you to be generous, allows you to be compassionate, allows God-given talents to come forward, allows you to have the capacity to forgive. The third highest category, 33 of you mentioned the Bethel Church family and how important and blessed you are to be in this church family. And you talked about small groups and music and singing and church staff and church leadership. The fourth category, and again, these won't come as any surprise, you mentioned friends. How important it is to have friends. And I think about how we love to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. Then 24 of you mentioned how important it was and how blessed you were to have a job. And the relationships within the work environment, to have medical coverage through uh, a job, the security of a job. Then the next category was health and how you were blessed to have good health or at least health care providers that take care of you so well. The next category, the seventh one, 17th of you mentioned how blessed you were to have a valuable 
husband or wife or partner in your life. And then the eighth category was uh, what I called basic necessities, that you thank God for food and water and shelter and travel, legs to walk on, eyes to see, corrective lenses to see. One of you mentioned how blessed you are just to wake up in the morning and have another day. The ninth category was home, the sanctity of home. And the tenth category, you were blessed because of some of the achievements that you were, have been able to attain in your life through education, uh, how it's led in the positions of wealth and position, and how you give God thanks for all of that. So family was first, but here's what is interesting. If you combine family with husband, wife, partner, if you combine family with home, uh, then you had 73 people mentioning family as so important. But if you looked at God and combine God with also the Bethel family, and with, um, just with the Bethel family, took God and the Bethel family together, you would have 75 responses. 75 for God and the things of God, and 73 for family. Isn't that interesting? All of a sudden, God then becomes the single most important thing in our lives, with family being a close, close second. God and family, those that are within your dear family uh, being so important. It's a beautiful thing because you realize that in order to have family, you've got to have this loving God. So I was impressed with the time that you took to write. I want to talk about uh, the blessings of vacation and a little bit of what happened to me when I was on vacation. This first picture I'd like to show you is from Maroon Bells. It is uh, one of the more beautiful spots near Aspen. Those mountains that look like bells in the background go 14,000 feet. And that water, that lake, is as clear as any water I've seen. And we walked along the uh, river that began, became uh, fast flowing. One of the things we used to like to do when we were on vacation is go to Estes Park, Colorado. And as we went uh, to Estes Park, we went through a town called Lyons. And Lyons was a beautiful, had a beautiful place as we w first uh, arrived where you, uh, where they had uh, cement animals that you could buy, you know, that you put in the yard. And my mother was always around, so we loved to get her a cement lamb or a cement rabbit for her or a duck for her uh, yard. And then they always served uh, the, this beautiful apple cider, different flavors, uh, crushed ice apple cider. Couldn't wait to see and stop by that place. But then when we got into Lyons, here's what's at that beloved place now. It's a headquarters for cannabis. <laughs> so now we couldn't drink uh, that beautiful apple cider. Uh, apple cider, you stop there now to... Get marijuana. Oh, how things change. <laughs> Every day when I was with my sister, sometimes twice a day, often twice a day, in the early morning and later on in the evening, I walked their dog, their yellow lab, Maggie. And Maggie and I, in the time we were there, we logged in 50 miles. Uh, and I got to walk through parks and reservoirs, and I remember one day as we were walking along the, uh, this reservoir area where there were homes on one side, this man said to me, uh, you have a beautiful dog. And I stopped and I looked at him and I looked at this beautiful backyard that he was manicuring and I said, thank you, and you have a beautiful yard you must be so proud of that. God must have given you this, this ability 
to see things uh, that only you can see. He blessed me with a compliment on Sadie, and I then felt the need to bless him. And, I, and he just smiled. He says, well, thank you. Thank you. He was a Hispanic fellow, so I have no idea whether he was uh, a man of faith or not. But blessings touch us. And then you know that I was going to Boise, Idaho, because a lot of you laughed and said, oh, that's quite a vacation. You're out west and you're going to Boise, Idaho. What in the world is in Boise, Idaho? Well, I really didn't know too much about Boise, Idaho, and now I know quite a bit about it. It's located in the, uh, the really the desert of the west. It has uh, a lot of reservoirs and a, an amazing aquifer, so uh, almost everybody has irrigation systems. And this one church that I'm going to talk to you about in three weeks, uh, they have a campus, a satellite campus, where they have uh, eight or nine or ten acres of land. They have a baseball field on it. They have a uh, free community garden. They gave away 20, over 20,000 pounds of produce last year. And they, and it looks green and lush. And they told me they only spent $400 on water last year. Untreated water, but good water for that area. One of the driving reasons for me to go there, as I've told you, is I wanted to meet up with this young man who has been so instrumental in my life as I was trying to be in his name, Bobby Wagner. Uh, this is Bobby and I at his house with his mother and stepfather, and now he's living in uh, Boise. Bobby, if, as I've told you before, is one of the greatest prayers I've ever seen. Uh, Bobby just was always by my side. Uh, and anytime if we had a worship service and somebody was uh, feeling bad, somebody was crying, Bobby would always get out of the seat and he would hug on people. And he was just so tender hearted. His father would tell me that he'd go to his room at night and would pray nonstop for at least an hour to an hour and a half. And I think that's where he, if we could only do something, if I could only do something like that, that's why I think he was such an easy prayer, was, was conversational with God. Loved uh, Christian music and contemporary Christian music. So uh, two things he asked when I told him I was coming out there, he just said, Mike, bring your anointing oil. Uh, and, and I forgot it. And he said, and I said, can I, it's your birthday, um, can I bring you an, a CD? He says, yes, make sure it has Great Is Thy Faithfulness on it. That's his favorite song. He can tell you the page numbers of him after him, but he knows 77. If you look it up in the uh, hymnal, is Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Well, his family and Diane and I, we went out to dinner. So this next picture is taken at Texas Roadhouse. I asked Bobby, I said, where's your favorite place to eat? And he says, Texas Roadhouse. I said, okay, then that's where we want to go. As we're walking in with his stepfather, I said, uh, how often do you get over here to, to eat? Uh, and he says, Pastor, we've only been here once. And it was a couple years ago when you sent us a gift card to Texas Roadhouse. And that's become his favorite place to eat. So he was talking about he was going to get this big cheeseburger with, with French fries. And, uh, and he, and I, as I'm walking in, I'm saying that to him, Bobby, um, uh, where would you like to go to get something for dessert? He says, Starbucks. <laughs> and and he's, he says, I'd like to get a, a strong black coffee. And he, Bobby just always loved coffee. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll do that. So he, of course, wanted to pray over our meal, and he, uh, he blessed the food and blessed the Starbucks coffee that he was going to be getting uh, uh, and a uh, few minutes after that. Then we came back to his house, and he and his mother, when she was living in the Lewisburg area, they would sing together in church and sometimes at coffee houses. And one of their favorite, my favorite songs that they did together was Lean On Me, the song by, some of you might know, by uh, Bill Withers. And so I said to his mother, uh, would you mind 
giving Diane and I a little concert. So she sat on a chair, and Bobby stood beside her. And uh, I said, Bobby, what would you like to sing? Well, one of the things he wanted to sing was Ring of Fire by Johnny Cash. <laughs> so we sang, they sang Ring of Fire <laughs> for us. And then uh, as they talked about songs, he said, um, I'll fly away. Would you sing I fly, I'll Fly Away? And, it, and he, did, he and his mother did a beautiful job. Here's a little bit of the end of Lean On Me, the classic one that the two of them do together. We need a hand. We all need He got out of that seat, as you saw, and he came over to me, and he put his hands on me. He says, Pastor Mike, I want to bless you. And he grabbed me, and he said, I want to bless you because you're a man of God. I bless you and Diane for coming all this way to see me. I bless you and your church. And I bless your sons, and I bless all the things you've ever done for me, and you do for everyone else. I wish I could have captured that moment on film, but we've done the cup of blessing before the two of us. There are many blessings in Scripture that can be a part of your daily walk and your devotional time. I'll close today with uh, a famous one that Moses asked Aaron to give in the book of Numbers from God. Here's one that Paul gives in Romans 15, verses 5 through 6 and verse 13. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. A blessing that I memorized from the 121st Psalm, it's the close of that psalm. I memorized it as with several other hymns or psalms when I was in elementary school. Maybe some of you did too. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forward and even forever. And then in, then in the book of Jude, it's only one chapter, only 25 verses. This is the way the book of Jude concludes. Now to the one who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of God's glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now, and forevermore.